Hello and welcome to Strictly Staffing, a web series for recruitment leaders. My name is Audrey Larty and I'm part of the media solutions team at LinkedIn, consulting on brand for our customers. And I'm Alex Sherido from the EMEA search and staffing team at LinkedIn based in London. Over the next 60 minutes, we we'll hope that you'll not only learn something new, but you'll take something inspiration back to your organizations. We are live and are being recorded, so if you have thoughts, ideas, comments or questions, please feel free to join the conversation. Use the comment boxes below or alongside the video to ask questions and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the show. And remember, if you're sharing your thoughts on LinkedIn, don't forget to use the hashtag Strictly Staffing. Now, the reason we're here today is to talk through the tectonic shift in the importance of marketing across the industry and explore proven growth strategies for search and staffing agencies, and hopefully set you up for some success in the future. Specifically, what we'll be covering today is reimagining what the future looks like for search and staffing firms. Hear from an agency that has used marketing to grow their brand and grow their business. Learn how industry leaders are using marketing to influence perception and growth, and understanding how to drive the top line of your business whilst maintaining your bottom line costs. So, let's get started. We had a chance to connect with the Atlantic Group to hear some of the challenges they face as they think about investing in marketing and its impact on candidate attraction and client acquisition. Let's check out what they had to say. The Atlantic Group is a full service recruiting firm that uh, started in 2006. We place candidates in temporary and full time positions in a number of verticals accounting, finance, information technology, healthcare, front office. We also do real estate and construction, admin support, HR, and sales. We started the Atlantic Group to change the way that staffing was handled at the time. In the beginning, it was very much a word of mouth process. You know, it was a smaller firm. We met with our candidates and our clients, and we did a great job for them, and then they sent us repeat business. But eventually you do get to a size where it's time to grow and try to figure out different ways to go about bringing in new candidates, new clients. The challenge was to really like how to go about doing that. Some of the challenges we had were on understanding where our audience was. Where do they hang out? What pages are they visiting? What social media websites are they on? That's always a struggle. We want to make sure that we're highly focused in our audience group so we can get the most traction. How do we build the brand? How do we get more candidates? How do we get more clients? We were looking for a new solution on how to do that. Through the reps that we have at LinkedIn, you know, they came to us with different ideas and different products we could buy that would help us with marketing the firm. Traditionally, in my seat as a CFO, I have, do have reservations. There is a lot of pressure, both from John and the partners, to accelerate our growth. So for this year, we decided that we were gonna move forward with LinkedIn. When we sat and we discussed how the plan works, we all agreed it would be the right move for our business. There's definitely a, a value in investing in outreach, creating that awareness for future growth where you will become a household name. We found a lot of value in the strategy that this product provides. Uh, it's been a new and interesting way to get new candidates that'll eventually turn into clients and it will definitely yield results for us in the future. Here at Atlantic, we have amazing people. It's our job to invest in these people through developing our brand and different media campaigns and give them the tools to succeed. I was really cautious when, when we first started, but now I'm really excited of where this partnership can take us. So far, we've been very happy with our, with our experience. Lincoln's got a great team and uh, they've helped us every step of the way. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Now that you have an idea of the few common challenges and pitfalls amongst search and staffing industry as it relates to media and marketing, I'd like to welcome our industry leaders to the discussion. They are going to share how they're able to influence the trajectory of growth for their agency. So let's meet the panel. I'll leave them to introduce themselves. So hello, I'm Elaine Tyler, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Venatrix. Uh, for some context, we specialize in placing graduates and early careers people into sales roles in fast growth SaaS technology businesses. And so we've been established for four and a half years, and we're a sub 20 person firm. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Sandeep, I work for the Udeco Group, which is a global HR talent solutions business. 
However, I work for the UK and Ireland part of the business with 2,500 colleagues. We're a, a 10 brand uh, global business uh, with many local brands within the UK, which I'll touch upon a little bit later. Excellent. Maybe we should just dive in. First question is to you, Elaine. Mm -hmm. When developing growth strategies for your business, what's the single thing that keeps you up at night when you're thinking about how you're going to successfully deliver on your plan? Mm -hmm. Okay, certainly. So uh, I think key is probably defining like what our actual growth strategy for 2020 is. And for the size of my organization and where we are on our journey, um, at the moment, our uh, objective is to dominate our sector and become the number one provider in what it is that we do currently with plans in the future to maybe expand into different markets and different geographies, etc. So for now, it's definitely about placing as many candidates as we possibly can. And um, I'm sure like many agencies that there are out there, we have the benefit of working currently in a climate that means that we can find jobs and we can find vacancies to work. So the candidate is the, is the key question. Um, and in fact, it's a question that I've probably been trying to solve for the last 13 years during my career in recruitment. Um, and I hate to break it to everybody. I still don't know the answer, uh, but I'm not one to give up. Um, but obviously that you know, leads very well into the topic that we're talking about today in terms of media and marketing and how you're actually going to appeal to a, a wider candidate audience to make sure uh, that you are driving and actually delivering for your clients, getting results and therefore achieving your growth strategy. Um, so although I don't have the answer, I don't think that there is the one answer. Um, so in terms of you know, what I think about uh, and what's keeping me up at night, it's like how do we market to our candidate audience uh, to become um, uh, able to deliver and uh, able to attract candidates that other agencies can't. And I know just from my kind of time speaking to customers when, through my job at LinkedIn, you're definitely not alone. Um, yeah. And I think we're all really on this journey to try and really find out what this kind of answer is. But I think there isn't going to be a silver bullet. I think it's going to be a combination of other things. Mm -hmm. Sandeep, I'd really like to look ask you a question around looking over your time working in recruitment mm -hmm. and all of the changes that you've probably witnessed. <laughs> um, what would you predict to be the biggest change and how recruitment leaders build and grow recruitment business, say, over the next five years? Um, working for a global business, um, there's a number of different elements to that. And we actually started looking at this back in 2017, so taking, right. taking it back three years before I go forward. And we released a report around global me megatrends, which were change in the world of work and the kind of, the, the kind of businesses that sit within it. And they included skills and balances, which kind of touches a little bit on your point because there's different types of people looking for roles and the, the types of roles are actually changing themselves through automation, which is another one of those megatrends, uh, alongside geopolitical um, and economical. And obviously, US elections quite a hot topic as of yesterday and, and today. And Brexit, of course. So there's been a number of different um, areas within the megatrends that have been affecting the world of work. And we've used those as a catalyst to think about what does the recruitment business and the talent business look like, uh, not only globally, but locally within the markets that we work with and respectively. And the UK market is quite fragmented. There's lots of competition, unlike some other markets out there. So we really need to stay ahead of our competition and think about how do we go and market our business to our candidates, but also to our consumers. So we've diversified our portfolio brands and globally we've introduced organisations such as General Assembly, um, who are an education business. But education that's supporting the skills and balances within recruitment currently, so we can upskill and reskill individuals, no matter what stage of the career they are, or what type of occupation they're currently in, if they have a certain type of background and qualify for it, we can support them through that process. And that's a really exciting business which is now active in 20 different countries and multiple campuses, large campuses, but also micro campuses, wherever we can put them in place. And that's really enabling us to reach a bigger audience of candidates. And they are a really exciting bunch to work with. And actually our um, uh, global CEO, Alanda Haz, uh, attended the World Economic Forum in Davos a few months ago. And we've actually committed to upskilling and reskilling 5 million people by 2030. So going beyond your five years to 10 years, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've actually committed to, to actually kind of achieving that particular figure. So there's, there's lots going on within the ADECO group. Um, we've also introduced uh, a new on-demand platform called Vetri, um, which is looking at recruitment for professional staffing uh, within finance and sales, 
um, and also in engineering, but much more on an on-demand um, method, which has just come over to the UK, so we're quite excited about that too. So no, like, it's small plans, really, generally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really I interested. I can't take credit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really interested in particular around kind of General Assembly, because are you able to give a little bit of a background for those people who haven't necessarily heard of them before? And, and what was it that was particularly attractive about them as an organisation to build on for you? Absolutely. So when we first acquired them, and obviously I wasn't directly involved in it, but I heard about this acquisition, um, the first reaction was an education business. OK, we're very much in the HR talent recruitment space. Why have we acquired this organisation? And it became very quickly clear that it channels into a lot of our verticals. So one being Lee Hecht Harrison, so where we look at outplacement and training and development. We have candidates who potentially may be displaced um, from one company. Um, so we can look at, rather than um, moving them out of that, that company, can we retrain them or reskill them, keep them in that organization um, and find new routes of work for them. So the organization itself is um, investing back in their people. Uh, there's also the opportunity for some companies who are struggling to get um, digital skills, such as data scientists, um, um, digital project managers, and within that area, um, I've spoken to some actually some large banks who typically are not the destination for those types of candidates. So if we can't actually source them, let's let's uh, reskill talent and put them back into your organisation. So that's why it's so applicable and so powerful, and also for graduates and apprentices. Um, if they've got a certain type of degree qualification or um, uh, education behind them which allows them to upskill and step up, that's something else we can do. And we're working also in Belfast um, where there's a big demand for Java and we're looking at people who may have two um, elements of a digital skill and look at how we top those individuals up to add a third. So there's quite a few areas that General Assembly is actually supporting. The recruitment business, which has been more of a traditional platform, um, and the two are combining really nicely to kind of support businesses out there. Awesome, thank you. My next question really is to you, Elaine. Recruitment businesses now are expected to deliver more on service and have a focus on expertise, almost as the norm, mm -hmm. um, which actually can make it harder to stand out from the competition when everyone's pretty much saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. When I think about your business, like how are you guys standing out from the crowd? But more importantly, how are you actually showing value to your clients and candidates. Mm -hmm, yeah, I think it comes back to the, uh, you know, the silver bullet uh, point that we mentioned before, uh, that there is kind of no one which way to do it. Uh, and especially as we have the focus on trying to generate as many candidates as we can, um, you know, we've got to create marketing content that's going to appeal to lots of different people that we want to net into our process and potentially assess for our clients. Um, so if I were to think about some of the activities that we've been doing most recently in order to uh, drive candidate acquisition, uh, you know, in the last year I have um, participated in a podcast about my journey to start Venetrix and what that really meant and why I wanted to do it to appeal to some candidates. Um, we have sponsored an event that means that when candidates are interacting with our business, um, the event's called Sales Confidence, it's the leader in, in its sector. Um, it means that candidates are not only coming and then just being placed and then forgotten about, but rather are then given access to best practice and understanding about how they're going to be um, top performers in the roles that we actually place them into. Um, we run candidate networking events of our own. Um, my team have a TV channel called Team V TV, where they talk about interview hints and tips. Um, the consultants will regularly write blogs. We're big advocates of video and also um, humanizing what it is that we do by uh, you know, basically demasking our agency and making sure that when uh, people come to view Venetrix and how, they, and how we might be able to offer them value, it's quite clear. Um, but no one of those is enough by itself. And I think that uh, you know, sometimes when you're taking your first steps into understanding how to really market your agency, kind of think, right, okay, 10 steps to delivering a successful interview. I've done that blog. Now what? Um, and you know, certainly at one point we were there. Um, but now we, you know, we, we market across lots of different channels. Uh, and somewhere that captures the imagination of the candidates that we go on to represent. And maybe each candidate finds a different piece of value in the content that we're putting out across all of those different mediums. 
God, you guys are busy. Are you actually <laughs> sleeping? <laughs> oh, okay, all right, that's good to know. This question's for you. Um, I know my experience of kind of working in recruitment mm -hmm. now, maybe, I think it's 11 years before LinkedIn. Recruiter productivity co continues to be one of the many things mm -hmm. that keeps leaders up at night. Um, the question is, and I suppose continues to be, how do we generate more revenue from our existing team of recruiters? What role do you see marketing playing to support this? Um, a, a huge role. So one of my teams that I, I direct manage is the sales team at the ADECA group. And the sales team has actually been working much more closer to the marketing team than ever before. It sounds quite simple and it should happen, um, but in some organizations they, they do work independently and they are, they're going out there and doing their individual initiatives. But we've now brought those two teams together, they sit together within our organization. Um, they are now looking at marketing from a pursuit perspective. Um, and changing the way we're actually putting content out there. So podcasts is definitely a route that we've, we've taken and you know, the, the market's very receptive to those sorts of mediums. But you have to segment out and think about who, what your verticals are, um, what your audience is and how you can reach uh, the masses but in a localised level. So you're actually still being quite discreet um, by the tools that you're using. And, um, we're always learning. Um, Data is obviously key, but the reaction of individuals is paramount for us. And one of the things that we've been doing within that space is putting out content, which is not necessarily, which is very easy to do, is use McKinsey, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, but our spin and our opinion on it. So, what do we truly think about the way the world of work is changing, or a certain sector is developing? And we put that out there to get a reaction. And by getting that reaction, we're driving not only our own content, but receiving content back from the people who are consuming it, which in return provides a really great digital dialogue um, between us and whoever the actual receiver of that information is. And that then drives more information out there. So we've been using um, surveys with articles that we've been putting out. And actually, in, um, in two weeks, we're launching our first uh, magazine, so our Insight magazine um, from the Udeka Group UK and Ireland, uh, which will be a curation of all the uh, articles and thought leadership that the marketing team and the sales team have collectively delivered, um, but in one pack that we can put out to our audience, and that's for uh, our clients, but also our candidates, to give them a bit more education about what we're thinking, but also uh, the changes that are happening within the different sectors and industries. So, you know, it's certainly an experience that I've had as well in terms of the transition from um, being a recruitment consultant in 2008 when I first started, when the job was very much focused around like dials per day and sending out CVs and very yeah. activity driven to, you know, and, and if somebody was like writing an article, your manager would be looking over your shoulder thinking, you know, why are you wasting your time doing that? Yeah. That's not yeah. your job. You need to be calling people. Um, whereas, like you know, we've obviously seen this change certainly over my career of 13 years so far. Um, that you know, we obviously actively now encourage um, people's commitment to the brand, their own personal brand and marketing. So last October, I was invited by um, Recruit Entrepreneur, which is the company that invests in Venetrix, to give a presentation about actually LinkedIn branding. And as part of that exercise, mm -hmm. I looked at the consultants in my company who were posting the most getting the most liked and getting the most engagement. Um, and lo and behold, those consultants also had the highest average billings over a three month period. So I can understand it does get mm. difficult sometimes when we're talking about the difference between direct sales and marketing. Um, but now when I actually interview consultants to join my company, I can't separate the two. So one of the questions that I ask them is, mm. um, if we were to hire you, tell me the title of three blogs that you would write about our industry. Or, you know, how do you actually feel about creating video content and putting it out there on LinkedIn and how would you go about doing that? But you do need to control it and make sure that the core activity is still there to get the results. It's a really, it's a really good point. And um, we ask exactly the same question um, of our colleagues and our teams within the business. And one of the things I think is really powerful is getting them to engage into something that's really a a passion project for them or something that's of real interest. So I love it when they talk about their individual brands because we have a multi-brand approach in, in, in the UK and Ireland. However, when they talk about a particular sector or a particular purpose within that, that adds just another edge to it. And to your point, the reaction they get is phenomenal 
and it builds up their own personal brand, mm. but it also gets, allows them to in, in, kind of engage with like-minded people um, and get a lot of content in return, which mm. I think is brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's really great to see you guys. Yeah. We often hear, this one question's for you, I'm quite keen to get your voices on this. Um, we often hear about the growing importance of technology mm -hmm. within recruitment, um, its ability to drive smarter decision making, help to reduce bias, automate repetitive recruitment tasks. Based on what you know about the industry mm -hmm. and what it takes to be competitive and succeed essentially, how do you ensure that your recruiters don't lose sight to how important it is to still have relationships with their clients and candidates? Absolutely. I think the processes are different depending on the type of audience you're connecting with um, and the type of recruitment that you're actually looking to do. So you do have to adapt and there's different shapes and flavours for the various sort of types of recruitment you're doing. And if I look at certain types of audiences, um, they're quite happy with an automated approach um, running all the way through the process. But it's really about the richness of data um, engagement that you have with them through that process and they want as much insight into an organization and what their beliefs are um, what they're looking to invest into and how they will invest into them and that doesn't have to be a physical person that always does that um, it could be through a virtual mechanism we've used virtual reality um, before and that's worked absolutely you know fantastically well um, we use, again, different podcast formats or audio books um, to make that happen. And you have to change the format, again, down to the audience that you're communicating. And sometimes you have it multi-layered. Um, if it's quite a, a big net that you're putting out there, depending on the type of recruitment that you're doing. And in some regards, you do have to have a high-touch approach also um, for various types of recruitment. So it, it does change. And, and we, we, we run a program from a marketing perspective, which I think is really relevant for this. And it's run globally, but we also have it locally managed, which is called the CEO for one month. Um, and it's currently accepting applications. Just a little plug little there. Plug there. <laughs> <laughs> and it runs in 48 countries, but here in the UK and I, and we're very competitive all the countries. And the, it, it does what it says in the tin. We're looking for an individual who wants to have access to the CEO within a country of the ADECO group and spend four to five weeks with them and follow them around in every meeting and every conversation, no holds barred. And they also get access to other C-suite members and other colleagues within the business. And, and that allows them to see um, an organisation from a slightly different vantage point through the diary of a CEO, which is quite, quite insightful. Um, as part of the process, um, we use the um, previous year's cohort to design the recruitment process. So they educate us on what worked really well and areas of improvement that we could look at and what uh, the new audience of 2020 um, actually wants to have as part of that. Is it, is it fully automated? Is it part automated? What's that content look like that sits behind it? And then as part of that process, we get them to evaluate what happened, but then they also think about what's going to be new in the next five years going back to your first question to me, um, and they help us develop new products. And we, uh, we've had lots of new services and concepts put forward by these individuals. One of them is a brand called Adia, um, which a chap from um, Italy, who was a CEO for one month there, successfully launched, and now it's a global brand within um, the Adeco group. So um, there's different routes we get that information, some obviously from data, um, and a lot from the individuals that we're interacting with. But it's just another uh, good marketing example just to share with you in terms of the reach and also the feedback we get. I'm quite interested, Elaine, from your perspective. Obviously, your businesses are very different in terms of size mm -hmm. and scale. Like, in terms of for you and your impact of technology and still making sure that you know, you're know you focusing on relationships, mm -hmm. what does that look like for a business of a slightly different, kind of come from a different point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking about this before. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's because my company places salespeople and, it, uh, um, and it's full of salespeople as well. I think that sometimes my challenge is actually getting them to the technology and right. away from the relationship. <laughs> um, but obviously, I think that you know the, the key. Uh, uh, we were also mentioning this before as well that I'm actually uh, really excited and delighted about the different technology platforms that are now available for recruitment companies. Obviously, you can't invest in them all, and you, uh, like any investment decision, you have to try and make the ones that you think are going to be right for your business and bring your return on investment. And then, obviously, the key part um, 
uh, uh, about making sure that the technology is being used correctly and that you're getting the value from it is then making sure that you lead from the front, certainly in my case, in my size of organization. So for example, recently we invested in a video platform where you can send messages to candidates. So one of the things that I did was then spend an evening sending a message to all of my staff as per, uh, uh, as per they would to prospect a potential candidate. Um, so you know, we're in the early stages of seeing the results of that, uh, but always looking to see what would be the next best thing when we're talking about that, trying to get hold of the, those candidates that other agencies don't have necessary access to. We use the same platform, it's very good. But, <laughs> um, but also your point around um, bias and unconscious bias, mm. um, we, we're very aware of that and think about tools that you can introduce that have really low adverse impact. Um, so we invest a lot of time looking at data, um, looking at candidate behaviour in terms of dropout rates at various stages of a process to truly determine the effect it has on different types of diversity groups um, but also within that how it affects different types of geographies across the country because there's a variance. So we've put a lot of investment behind that and we have a, uh, we've created an assessment practice but also we have a diversity solutions business internally and the two work very closely together to make sure the tools that we're using um, are the right tools but also educating hiring managers and recruiters about the right techniques to use when um, uh, interviewing and assessing people, which we were talking about assessment centres earlier as well, which is vitally important. I'm going to shift the question a bit mm -hmm. um, to focus on brand, mm -hmm. something that's close to my heart, because uh, first and foremost, I am a marketeer. Um, and the question really is to, uh, I'd start with you, Elaine, but I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, Sandy. In your experience, mm -hmm. how have you seen the role and importance of brand, I'll put that in mm -hmm. inverted commas, change and evolve mm -hmm. in terms of how it, the place it, it has within the boardroom? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, certainly through my career of sitting in boardrooms, a, a bigger issue than ever. And, you know, obviously we all understand, you know, why that would be the case, given how readily information is available and everybody's fingertips and immediate. And I think, um, you know, when you think, when you think about the old saying of when somebody has a good experience, they tell one person, and when they have a bad experience, they tell five. Well, now they tell 5,000 <laughs> or 5 million. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, I'm actually pleased about that because what it means is it pushes every single service provider to be the very best that they can be because ultimately... Um, you know, one of the things that has really lifted Venetrix's um, performance, you know, through the last year, it was a record breaking year for us. We smashed our, uh, our be personal best month four times over and one company of the year, I think was certainly by having um, brand ambassadors. So people who were prepared to go online unprompted by us and talk about the, the amazing service that they had and there is no greater marketing um, material than that, I don't think. Um, so therefore it becomes a boardroom conversation because it's about, so how are you delivering your service? You know, why are you delivering better candidate experience than, and, and client experience than any other business that's out there? And ultimately that comes down to the processes, the investments that you make, the people that you hire. Um, so yeah, I think it's certainly an important boardroom conversation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, how would you look at that, building on Elaine's answer, this idea that brand is now integral, it's an integral pillar to success? It really is. I mean, we, we use the word purpose right. in, in marketing with brands. It's associated very often. And, um, you know, whatever your message is from a brand perspective, it truly has to have a purpose and a meaning behind it. And, you know, our, our, our kind of strap line is making the future work for everyone. Um, and that kind of relates back to some of the points that I made earlier. But also you need to bring it closer to home and you need to um, not only have it in the boardroom, but get validation from your colleagues around the business. And we have started a program a couple of years ago called Leaders Edge. And this is a talent development program for people within our organization in UK and Ireland who um, want to kind of move up and, and do different things and stretch themselves. And one of the projects um, a team within that group did was look at how do we recruit our own people and how do we go about um, putting the right sorts of messaging out there. And they created a fantastic campaign and in some regards probably schooled a lot of the board about you know, how to really engage with certain types of audiences and what purpose to put out there. And it's been absolutely fantastic in terms of its engagement. Uh, 
First and foremost, internally, because going back to your point, internal engagement ambassadors are really, really important. And if they see that we're investing in the types of people that we're bringing into our own, own organisation, that's a powerful um, employer brand process. And the social media and the activity that has been picked up from people internally to push out this wonderful marketing content that they produce, um, which they've done all off their own back, um, is absolutely brilliant. Great video content, great social media stuff. So I think, yes, the boardroom is really important for us to have our own um, purpose behind that. However, extend it out to other people within your business because they also have a very strong and valuable opinion. You touched on an important part there. I mean, all throughout this conversation, I've been talking about clients and candidates, but ultimately now you have a third audience that probably you're thinking about even more. And this is actually people who you're thinking to actually bring into your business and employ a brand. Like, mm. Have you both seen that shift change throughout your time working in the space? Mm -hmm. um, Start so with you, Elaine, first. Yes, I mean, just to kind of speak from the uh, personal experience of you know, Venetrix, uh, you know, I started that company four and a half years ago when I like, turned a computer on, sat at a desk by myself, and there was no one, you know, I didn't even have an email signature, right? I had to write <laughs> one myself. Um, so at that point, I had zero brand and no one to do any marketing. Um, so when I think about, I mean, I think that the key part about it is it doesn't just suddenly happen and you've got to go and chip away at it every single day. Like I said, engage over all of those channels multiple times and don't give up on it up until the point where, you know, you've uh, 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 cultivated a team of people who believe in your journey and mission and they themselves are spreading the, the word that then, you know, from, from the result of my business now, uh, now has uh, manifested in people, you know, actively chasing me to want to work at Venetrix, where if you told me that four and a half years ago, I'd never have believed you. Um, and if you look at the, the way in which, like, my team actually make that happen, because I think that's really where it comes from, the consultants themselves saying this is a great opportunity. Um, you know, I was thinking about us sitting down and discussing this topic. Um, you know, one post that somebody did about a new team member joining in the last two weeks got over 36,000 views. Um, so it's that type of sharing of the stories that are happening internally that's driving uh, staff to be keen and open to the concept of working at my company anyway. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're a really passionate bunch and we, we work hard and um, enjoy our time off just as well. <laughs> and we, we have a really, really passionate um, group of two and a half thousand individuals who work in, in the UK and Ireland and they are all, they've always been very, very uh, proactive in promoting their own brand. But what's been really, really beautiful to see is that, that they're now promoting the broader, what we call the ecosystem, which is a whole cluster of brands that we have within the ADECO group and are really pushing out the message about how great it is to work within the organisation, um, how um, they work locally within a branch um, or an office versus what it's like to work in one of our hubs or a head office. So the communication and the social content that's been put out um, is absolutely brilliant. And we, we really kind of made a point of this as being a, a mindset change within um, our kickoff at the start of this year to look at really about how do you have more of a growth mindset and it's okay to have an opinion um, out there and build your personal brand. And they have definitely picked up on that and they're doing that in abundance. And that is actually really encouraging to hear that both of you are really talking about empowering your employees and really allowing them to feel confident to go out there. Because I know when we look at where customers win on the platform, it's actually those who are looking at the employer brand, especially looking within staffing, that the employees are saying things. It's not, it doesn't come from a corporate mouthpiece, even mm -hmm. though we recognize that that has some importance, but empowering your guys to really feel compelled to tell their story because it's far more credible. It's really important because um, having done employer brand on behalf of clients as a paid service, one of the things that we always look at is what is your shop window, your website, your content um, socially versus what it's like to, to come and work for you in your organisation and sometimes you know, speaking to certain individuals, they feel like they walk through the wrong door because the experience that they've had up through the recruitment and selection process has been significantly different to what they're actually experiencing in-house in the job. So we, we use a methodology called join stay. So the people who stay and are high performance and really developing, moving the business are the sorts of people who should be promoting 
um, those who want to join an organisation who have got the same sort of mindset and ambition. So that's the sort of model we use between, between the two. So what we're doing internally is pushed out externally. But also, if somebody joins a business, we want them to have the same experience throughout the whole employee life cycle. And if they do decide at one point to move on, we're very proud because they've been part of our business for a really long period of time. And hopefully they'll come back um, at some point in the future. So the whole employer brand piece is critically important, not just for the front, but for the entire cycle of their employment. Certainly. I mean, feeds in, it's similar to the same transparency that you're trying to create around placing candidates, isn't it, where people can really um, you know, see themselves as, as that person that's on the screen creating the video or in the picture. Mm. Um, so you know, when I think about uh, what my team have done with exposing their candidate stories of people that they've placed, uh, you know, it's very much that in, uh, instead of the, um, you saying it's great to work here, or give me a referral, yeah. it's here's a story of somebody who's enjoyed the experience of either being placed by us or working in this business. Uh, you know, and again, to kind of put some stats behind that, I looked at a recent candidate story that we'd done and 46,000 pa 46, people had viewed that post. Uh, whereas if we just put, give us a referral, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we would have got that many views. <laughs> yeah. No, it's excellent. Okay, so this next question is very much uh, with myself in mind, my other marketeers that are out there, you guys both sit on the boards and you're leaders now. And, and I know from my experience <clears throat> that when it comes to recruitment leaders, if you don't have something that's driving a direct business revenue, it generally won't be made a priority. Um, so really this is almost something and was an advice piece to marketers out there from the mass of leaders. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to marketers on how best to start influencing the board? What are various stages is that they might be at this process of incorporating brand and marketing into an integral part of their business? Mm -hmm. How should we do it? What we should be saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th I think it's a you know naturally a really tough question, and through the many iterations that Venetrix has existed in only the short space of four and a half years, um, you know initially in order for us to start making decisions around. Uh, marketing investment, um, we had to really prove our process. So that's ultimately step one, unless, unless you've maybe got a revolutionary idea that you think is going to um, allow you to attract candidates and clients, then really getting the basics right is the most important piece. And I think the next part is that an investment in marketing doesn't have to be costly or expensive. And sometimes even you know when you start to discuss that, you can um, if you focus it all around money, um, then actually you can scupper your creativity because you know hopefully a lot of the things that I've talked about today, you know, podcast, having people into your office, um, you know, creating blogs and videos, they are realistically things that don't cost very much money. Um, to the point where I grew my organisation, I was uh, happy to start to extend budget towards marketing. Uh, you know, I defined what that was and then made decisions about how to invest it and then looked back on the results that I was capable uh, of generating from that investment. And now in the kind of third stage of my company, as maybe I think of it, I now have kind of like a marketing risk budget like an amount of money that I feel comfortable and my investors feel comfortable with us investing periodically in new, um, uh, uh, new ideas and concepts to see if they work. Because ultimately with marketing, you know, with marketing there are certain methodologies where it is difficult to understand until you try them. Um, so almost kind of like a, a build up and a progression around how you're trying to uh, influence the marketing budget within the organisation. I have to totally agree with that point, and it's it's not about the money that you throw at marketing. It's it's basically the the um, authentic nature of the message you're putting out there, and that doesn't cost anything. That's really down to your own time investment um, and building a basic toolkit of instructions and guidance, more so actually, um, to your colleagues within the business about encouraging them to tell their story getting your clients to do likewise, getting your candidates also on board to support you through that process. And that's the sort of message that um, the, the marketplace wants to hear. Um, yes, you have to do some tactical stuff, um, which is around events and planning and some corporate communication, and you do a few occasional gatherings, and we have a calendar bill out for that. But I've, I've tasked all of my, my team um, to do a thought leadership paper um, 
it doesn't have to be long, it could be a couple of paragraphs, it could be opinion paper, um, to put that out there about what they're thinking about something that's currently happening within the marketplace. And it could be directly focused on recruitment or something that has an effect um, based on a mega trend around recruitment itself, be it geopolitical or otherwise. So, yeah, um, we, we don't have to um, go cap in hand anywhere because I think it's down to your own initiative to do something. Makes sense. I want to really talk to you both really around all the discussion that I've seen and probably you've seen as well around this idea that diverse ideas and experiences really help businesses to innovate and stay competitive. And so with that in mind, I wanted to ask you if you were to design your recruitment leadership team of the future, made up of the leaders that would prepare you for all of some of the challenges we've talked about today, what do you think would be the kind of skills or the experiences that would be sat around the boardroom table that possibly may not have been considered 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some, some very obvious ones. Um, that you know, these days we are more concerned around making sure employee well-being is, is high up on the agenda, and perhaps there would be a full representative for that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, certainly something that would be important to me would be starting to think about a business's environmental uh, impact, and I, I don't think that would have been present 20 years ago, certainly. I totally agree. Um, I was doing a bit of research for um, our recent uh, kickoff to do my presentation, and to that point, there's a word of a year that the Collins Dictionary puts out every, every year. And in 2018, it was single use for single use plastic. Um, last year was um, climate change. Um, so we kind of adopted that ap approach because we know those are really important factors out in, out in the marketplace. So we want to bring those sorts of uh, belief systems onto our board. So we're factoring those in. And so much so, we also did a community piece um, at our conference, our kickoff, where three of the board members, including myself, talked about our personal experiences because we want to be in a place where we've got open dialogue but also can be open about some of the challenges that we face. So I talked about being a neurodivergent um, individual and um, I only felt comfortable about talking about it a few months ago because it was a certain time in my life, um, a certain point in my career or an age and I felt it was the right thing to do. Um, and we basically, when we think about our board, we want our board to be open, um, share as much information as they feel comfortable in doing so because what that does it encourages your colleagues to open up and also think about how you relate to somebody else on the board that that job that role is not unattainable and people at all levels within a business go through different challenges and that's really really important to to know and i create my own word of the year which was <laughs> <laughs> which was change for 2019 because we really want to change the way we communicate to our to our colleagues but also out to our um, potential consumers and candidates, um, but also for this year it was around growth. So how do we kind of make that happen and continue to do that? And you know, other people are, apart from the ones that you mentioned around the boardroom would definitely be around data science. Yeah. Um, you know, that's definitely a kind of a topical thing. So I don't think you need as many salespeople around um, a boardroom table for a recruitment business, but you need individuals who could support and enable what um, our colleagues on the front line are actually doing. Oof, okay, uh, thank you to all the viewers. We've actually had quite a few live questions that have come <laughs> in. We really do appreciate how much you're engaging with that today. So um, I think it's probably best that I just dive into some of the live questions that have come through. Okay. First question, uh, and feel free to either one of you to take yeah. it. Um, what KPIs are most important to you as you evaluate the success of marketing programs? Yeah, sure. So from a KPR perspective, it's one uh, reach and engagement. So probably more engagement rather than reach because it's about the feedback you're getting on the content you're putting out there. Um, and it's a validation of if it's the right sort of information that, the, um, that your consumers, your candidates want to hear. Um, or if you need to tweak it based on what they're actually looking for. So for me, the measure is always um, how receptive um, has an audience been to something that you've actually um, um, added to social media or LinkedIn or whatever it might be. <laughs> and I think what's really tough about it is understanding if it's even the right content and the right audience. Exactly. And okay. I think that before you start to see results from it, you can become very caught up around that and thinking about like, am I doing, am I putting the right content out to the mm -hmm. right audience? Ultimately, 
there is only one K real key KPI, and that is placements made. So, mm. um, you know, in, in, in our business, we know we do the engagement, we know we do the outreach, we have the support of the marketing team and, and our investors who tell us about how many conversions we're getting from, you know, LinkedIn or Facebook on back onto our uh, own website and people applying for jobs. Then it's about making sure that the consultants are correctly uh, attributing those people to the right sources so that you can make good decisions next budget year about mm -hmm. where to invest you know, further money and resources. Because one of the things I definitely, to add to all of that, it's really, I know the ultimate goal is placements, but the placements can take a matter of weeks or months, depending on how quickly the turnaround. So almost being able to work out what are some of the performance indicators that know that you're going to lead to a successful placement. Mm -hmm. How many candidates need to get to first stage interview? You know, how many uh, job views do we need typically? How many candidate applications? So really starting to measure all of the little steps that yeah. potentially can take through it, mm -hmm. mainly just because the process, if you're simply just waiting for, revenue mm. it can actually take longer and be mm. and I've seen in my experience it'd be interested to know what your thoughts are that if if immediate results aren't seen mm. the plug can sometimes be pulled mm -hmm. so being able to have information that can be socialized in the run-up to mm -hmm. placements as well yeah I think it sometimes depends on the type of um, advertising mm -hmm. or messaging you're putting out there so for example if you're doing programmatic advertising you know we tend to look at um, the different types of messages mm -hmm. that you would put out and see which ones are working so you're doing a bit of testing yeah. um, to then enable for large programs where you're recruiting in mass and volumes um, to determine what's going to give you the best return rate of quality of candidates yeah. and then how your applicant to hire reduces but also then time and everything that's kind of within that process also becomes much more efficient. Um, so you have to look at your different forms of media first of all and do the analysis mm -hmm. and occasionally dip your toe in and understand if it's something slightly new or niche or in a geography that you're not used to and then build out from there. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think if you're like a small agency owner like me and you're um, you know, probably wearing lots of different hats on a day-to-day -day basis, mm. you know, still very operational in your business, still focused on making sure that you're generating, you know, immediate revenue and getting results and delivering for clients, it can be very easy for what feels like outreach with no results to get pushed down to the bottom of the, of the list. Um, but my advice for anybody in that position would be don't give up. Um, because I'd be very surprised if you've got to the point where you are in your career and you're running an agency that you don't know something really pertinent to say to your audience and eventually it will pay off. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I'm going to move straight on. This question actually is for Lane. Yeah, Lane. So um, it's a little bit longer, so I'm going to read just straight word for word here. Okay. The competition for recruitment talent in Silicon Valley has never been higher due to historic lo lows in unemployment. Retention rates in the recruiting function have felt the impact at both staffing firms and large tech companies. It's the norm to see recruiters jump from company to company every one to two years. Mm -hmm. How do you approach hiring for your own teams? And how are you retaining top people against poaching from large employers like Facebook, Google, and Odeco for talent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, so the beauty of Fenetrix is that because what we do is run assessment centers to find talented people early in the early stages of their career to join sales businesses, we uh, have the benefit of meeting 20 potential recruitment consultants who could come and join Venetrix on a weekly basis. So, you know, for, certainly for kind of candidate attraction and flow, um, you know, we certainly have an advantage there. Um, when we're questioning those people, we are very much trying to understand what their true motivations are in their career, um, what it is that they're aspiring to achieve, and therefore if Venetrix is going to be a good fit for that. Um, in, terms of, in terms of retaining people, um, which I think is a challenge for you know lots of businesses out there. No matter your brand, no matter how you know, even as desirable as you are as an employer, mm. you know it can be very different for people when they walk through the door, sit down at the desk, and then do that another 365 times about how they feel about working at that at that business. So I think the key part is making sure that all of your staff understand what you, the journey that you're on and the part that they're playing in it. Because the truth is, there is always going to be somebody who's potentially got a more glamorous office or a better incentive mm. or can pay them more money or maybe has a better commission scheme. So it's about um, having that authentic engagement and not just a missions for missions sake. Um, communicating with people uh, to make sure that everybody understands what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, and that those people you know, feel passionate, engaged and that they're going to you know, get a benefit from, from being part of it. Excellent, thank you. Questions for both of you now. 
Do you as leaders prioritise the allocation of market, marketing budget towards attracting candidates or clients or both? Is there a split in how you allocate your budget? Uh, we do it for both. Okay. Uh, however, we're becoming much more um, effective and efficient with the spend around candidates because you know, ideally we want um, advocacy um, from the candidates that we're placing. So be it on a temporary or permanent basis directly into clients, we would like to stay uh, connected to, to the temporary candidates and then look at how we support them through the life cycle of what they, they want to do. So as much um, uh, repeat communication and management of them is, is really important for us. Um, and from a, from a client perspective, it goes back to my point earlier, um, we try to do more uh, work through our colleagues um, about their opinion pieces and their thought pieces uh, and also occasionally hold an event um, where we have someone who's from the industry to kind of talk a little bit more about um, what their opinions are and have some open dialogue. And then actually what we do off the back of that is use a lot of content from the people who are turning up to those events to drive future thought leadership pieces. So we're actually using our audience and um, specialists within the marketplace to do that. Perfect. I think as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I've committed the last 13 years of my life to answering this question about how we can find more <laughs> graduate salespeople to work in technology businesses. Um, so the beauty of that means that, um, you know, a lot of people who work in technology organisations may have heard of Venetrix or may know my name simply by the tenure that I've spent and the time I've actually committed to, to this profession specifically. And, um, you know, we do have a marketing spend that's associated with clients. Um, you know, I think once upon a time, maybe it was very much associated around new clients, whereas now we like to think about our mm -hmm. client relationships mm -hmm. and how we're actually going to get um, the most amount of uh, revenue return out of those relationships that we do have. Um, ours is focused around candidates in the majority in terms of our budgeting because, you know, as a small agency, I'm you know, very committed and, and very, uh, you know, grateful to the clients that we have worked with. And I would, uh, until we reached the capacity that we were, you know, had a, an overflow of candidates, I wouldn't want to take on too many clients that we would disappoint the clients that we already have by the demand for the candidates. So right now in this market, and it could change, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, our, our focus is on making sure that we're maximizing our opportunity to find potential sales talent for our companies, for our clients. Fantastic. Another question. What is the most productive and efficient way to build your client base? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first, Cindy? <laughs> uh, it's targeting what client base you want in the first place is, is definitely um, the, um, the advice I'd give and also what story you have to tell within that particular sector. Um, so for me, it's really down to having capability mm -hmm. um, and having confidence that you can support a client um, in delivering against their needs. Um, if it's an uh, area of new ventures that you've not done before, um, then it's exciting, but also you have to be very kind of exploratory about how you go about doing that. But for us, it's, it's, it's looking at uh, where we've had previous success um, and how we build out on that and support other organisations. Because my company is uh, relatively niche, niche in the actual sector that we target, it's quite clear the type of businesses that we're going to work with. So I think it certainly feeds back into the point of uh, making sure that you've got brand ambassadors who've mm. had uh, you know, an experience that they want to shout about when dealing uh, with Venetrix and working with us. Um, and another tip, if you want to build your client base, <laughs> so obviously we talked a lot about marketing today and I think yeah. it's really, really important. Um, but you know, you know, as a you know, recruiter to recruiters, um, don't forget to actually pick up the phone, have those conversations and engage with people because it might even surprise them. There you go. <laughs> Keeping it old school. I, I like that. I the way it happens. <laughs> You've got to do both. Yeah. yeah. You do. You know. I've got like a, this question here that's come in. Um, in this market, it's really hard to differentiate yourself as a recruiter. And I'd love to learn ways on how to get candidates to respond to my outreach. And um, so we've certainly been using video platforms and I think that that's helped. Um, Personalised messages to people um, and also uh, sometimes potentially uh, I think that a really important thing to do with candidates to gain their respect, this might not be necessarily about gaining more candidates, but certainly about improving your capability as a consultant, is saying no to them or telling them things that they don't expect, as in like, you shouldn't maybe apply for this job. 
And somehow that stark reality, certainly, you know, when I've done that with clients and candidates, like you shouldn't hire this person, um, you know, g gives you a lot more credibility as a, as a person that maybe, maybe that could in the future help you get more candidates. Uh, yeah, it's probably not putting out um, always we're hiring, uh, <laughs> to your point earlier. It's, it's having more, more, more of a message around the, the purpose of what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some cases, also looking at the type of message you're putting out there to see if it actually adapts to the audience that you're looking to gain talent from, because sometimes you have to change your language, your words, and your construction to make it much more applicable from a, from a diversity perspective. And I think that's really important to mention. And the other point would be to look at transferable skills. So if, you, if you're not having success in the market and you're trying and trying again, um, where else could you get that talent and retrain them um, to put into the roles that you have? Mm -hmm. And potentially, like, how much time are you spending investing in your passive candidate strategies? So mm. you know, if you're always expecting the vacancy to, um, to appear and then for you to just suddenly have the perfect candidate or like head to a database or do a post about it, then you know, no, you're not necessarily always going to have a great flow of candidates. Whereas if you're regularly engaging with people, perhaps sharing marketing content with them that might be relevant even when they're not necessarily searching for a role, you'll find that overall the amount of people that you have to speak to about a vacancy is obviously considerably increased. Yeah, yeah. and you, we can turn, you can turn passive to receptive yeah. if you use programmatic advertising, if the budget allows to do that. It's not very expensive yeah. to use that form of advertising. It really truly allows you to target audiences that typically you wouldn't reach with, with other forms. And I think, I think to add to all of that, it's really thinking beyond simply the one-to-one -one outreach. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, the one-to-one -one outreach is that point where you almost have that mandate already on the table. The clock's ticking, you need to get over a shortlist. If you are aware there are certain talent pools that are the hard to fill, yeah. what are you doing before that? How yeah. are you kind of almost warming that audience up, mm. creating actual pools before you need them, almost on the bench, so to speak, mm -hmm. so they know you, they trust you, and they're willing to work with you. So when that call go old school, pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> when it's time to call, they're actually a lot more receptive because they know who you are and they trust you as well. I think that is a component that can really support that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, more questions are coming in, so let's keep diving in. Um, what are some of the good ways to build brand awareness online, especially on social media like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram? I suppose, personally, what are you finding that's working for your businesses? So I think that the absolute key is you have to be consistent. So you could, you know, you, obviously posts are going to vary in the engagement that they get and potentially the quality from you. Um, I don't know, the last three posts that I've done, one's been about... Um, one's been, been about my event that I'm running tomorrow for International Women's Day where we're going to have some SAS leaders speak to some emerging talent in the market. One of them was about my birthday, which was yesterday. Happy birthday, <laughs> <Thank birthday. you. laughs> um, And then uh, I think one of them was about coming here. Oh. Um, and obviously all of them have got engagement, different types, different people, but I have the commitment that I know that I'm going to post pretty much every day, at least four out of five days. Mm -hmm. So I think that the key is around the consistency that isn't going to be that one post. Yeah. Yeah, it's less about the sharing. It's more about the original content you're putting out there. And it goes back to my point earlier about do something you're passionate about or something that you truly believe in. Um, so some of the posts, if somebody looks at my, my LinkedIn profile, um, a lot of them are around neurodiversity in the recruitment space. And I get a lot of reach back from people who engage with me and it's a discipline, but also it's something that is really important to me. So that's what I do behind. So pick something that you like to do, but you have to keep on doing it. <laughs> a bit more highbrow. <laughs> yeah. As we head to a close, I want to thank both Elaine and Sandeep for sharing their insights and learnings. It's been great. To make sure that you can apply all that you've heard today to your business, I want to provide you with a few actionable next steps on how to get started. As you start to think about how building momentum with this, take the time to audit where you are right now and use this as the foundations on which to build your plan. This is probably the most important part of winning with marketing and it gives you a baseline to where to measure from. Secondly, and it was mentioned today, find your authentic voice as a leader and as a business taking into consideration all of the moving parts of your organization. Marketing is a team sport. It's no longer the sole responsibility of your marketing function. Everyone from your receptionist to the CEO has the opportunity to shape your brand both on and offline. 
And lastly, understand the audience that is important to the growth of your business and be deliberate about putting your message in front of them at scale. Whilst using the opportunity to test, learn, take those intelligent risks. And based on your message and your reach, this will determine how you realize efficiencies and translate this into meaningful return and investment. I want to thank again our panelists. All of you that have viewed and actually sent through questions, we try to get as many through of them as possible, but thank you, we really do appreciate you engaging with us. Our LinkedIn media productions team, it takes a lot to kind of pull this stuff together. And of course you, our staffing community for joining. Let us know what you liked, what you'd like to see more of, and ideas of topics we can cover in upcoming episodes. Once again, I'm Audrey Larty. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and share feedback on the show and be on the lookout for upcoming episodes. At LinkedIn, we're passionate about connecting talent and opportunity. And as a staffing community, you actually play a crucial role in making that happen every day to keep up the good work.